Right, I would like now to leave the floor to Professor Paolo De Castro, President of the Agricultural Commission of the European Parliament, who will tell us about the evolution of the PSC negotiations, the joint agricultural policy, and the most important hot topics. Well, good morning to all of you, and welcome back. It is my second time at this very interesting event organized by Angelo Rossi and his team by Clark. Congratulations, because we really have here many experts, many university colleagues. The whole world of milk has convened here, and I'm very glad about this. Well, I have actually heard some very interesting presentations with many interesting remarks regarding what is actually happening on the markets today. And I really have the temptation of expressing my own remarks uh, as an analyst rather than as a politician. This is a big temptation, of course, but I know that most of you are keen on knowing what is happening in Brussels, which are the novelties specifically as far as the renegotiation of the reform of our agricultural policy and uh, negotiation of the union market where there are innovations also as far as milk is concerned. But before talking about Europe, milk agricultural policy and so on and so forth, I would like to make a few remarks because I actually uh, prepared some slides which have partially been made uh, redundant by some presentations, especially uh, the ones that has actually pinpointed market developments. So this is just a way to bring your attention back to the fundamentals. I mean, we heard before that there are many different markets, there are many different prices. Each area and each negotiation are characterized by different terms and scenarios. However, fundamentals do not change. And this slide also shows us which is the driving force of the significant change in the demand for food products, specifically for milk. Here we have the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. That's what the acronym stays for. So let's have a look at what is happening as far as a huge de demand is concerned. There are growth trends in terms of consumption, which are really impressive. Let's just quote China, where milk consumption has more than doubled in the last eight years. Russia has become the number one importer of butter and the second importer of cheese worldwide. Brazil is still growing with a growth rate of 4% in terms of milk production, uh, consumption. And India is growing by 5% per year and next year will become a net importer of milk. I mean, this explains all the other slides. Here you can see the growth of the Chinese market, both consumption and production. I mean, what is happening in these countries is something really extraordinary. And I would like to recall what I told you last year as well, that is a driving force of this change. is not of demographic nature. I mean, demographics are very important, but the driving force for this change is the increased per capita income. This actually changes a person's diet, and that's a driving force for change, because the higher the per capita income, the greater the change in composition of demand for food, with a shift from vegetal to animal proteins. And the Asian markets are now having a significant impact with a supply growth which cannot keep up with the growth of demand. So that's the cause. All the rest is the consequence. And then, of course, price volatility. What is price volatility? We've seen this before. 
I also have a slide on price volatility, which is the consequence of this instability. This is clear. Instability due to the fact that if there is a greater demand for food than uh, the existing supply, it is obvious that small changes, say, a particularly bad weather in a certain part of the world, or the decision of Russia to have export duties, or decisions made in one specific area of the world will have amazing repercussions on the market. So market instability, following the unbalance between supply and demand, produces an increase in price volatility and an increased risk. But this is just to show you, this slide is not updated, but unfortunately this is still the trend. I mean, Europe is going down as far as its weight in world exports are, is concerned. We're talking about important players such as the United States and New Zealand. But it is also interesting to see that in case Europe is becoming less and less important, the United States maintain their significance and in some cases like milk powder they're growing and New Zealand is becoming the new protagonist with a strategy as far as the Asian markets are concerned because New Zealand has now become the number one supplier to China and this of course will have some consequences. Also because we know, and this is a slide about volatility, which however also shows us the correlation between commodities and milk. Here you can see a comparison between milk and soybeans. Well, of sure, for sure we can complain about market tr uh, price trends when there is a lack of balance between the price and production costs, the situation is bad. But in the medium term, if you have a look at this, there is a very strong correlation. And therefore, we're going through a stressful moment as far as costs are concerned, but sooner or later, this will rebalance via an increase in the price of milk. So this is the trend, and there is a correlation, a pretty strong one as well. So apart from the issue of volatility, Europe has to worry about this because in Europe we lack soybeans. 90% of our needs are covered by imports. I mean, Europe imports 90% of the soybeans used here. Do you realize this? I mean, when the commodity market was a rich market, prices were going down, you could find every commodity you wanted at a low price, the problem was neglectable. But we are going through a moment when the different regions of the world hunt for agricultural products and commodities in general. Think about what China is doing at any terms of outer or external investments in terms of estates, land grabbing, and so on and so forth. But also, as far as contracts are concerned, they are signing long-term contracts with Brazilian soybean producers. I'm talking about 20-year contracts. So the worldwide market of soybeans is strongly affected by Chinese demand, and we import 90% of what we need. And we're worried about this. We always think that we're going to find a solution. But we have to be on the alert given the present scenario. So the issue of the European agricultural potential, which was viewed until short ago uh, at the time of surplus, at the time when milk powder is the lyric called this, was viewed as a surplus commodity. We always had to take measures as far as milk powder was concerned. But this world is over. We live in a totally different world with the problems that we have just heard about. But with interesting opportunities as well. I really liked the presentation about the futures. 
Beirut futures are a very interesting tool. These are all tools that try to manage the risk because when the market is unstable and volatile, it is necessary to manage risk in the best possible way. And we are also making some efforts in this direction. However, from this viewpoint, it is amazing to see that the adaptation of policies to the new international scenario is still lacking. Very little has been done. I mean, if you think about the European concept as far as agricultural policies are concerned, uh, it's lagging behind. We're still in the 90s. We are still concerned about the environmental issue full stop. We need to further develop this policy. And we have to include food safety and the production side. Food safety and security, so also food supply. But it seems that uh, this is not such a relevant topic. Okay, every now and then there are some interesting presentations, but our policies uh, actually do not take this aspect into due consideration. In other words, the European policy still follows the leitmotiv of the Agenda 2000, Franz Frischler's reformation, Marine Fischer's recipes, I and mean, things have not changed. We're still going that way. We're still focusing on environmental issues only. There's no worry about food security. And the paradox is that when we talk about a European agricultural policy, the United States are debating their farm bill which is the equivalent to the European one, but they are really concerned about supply and food security. And this is a paradox because the United States, unlike Europe, are the most important export area for commodities. So we in Europe should worry about this, but we do not even think about the problem because we still have the grading application issues and problems. But I mean, our policies do not go to the point, and the tools which are proposed by the Commission have nothing to do with all this. Having a stronger role in the European Parliament today, we have managed to do a little bit in this direction, but it is the Commission that proposes in Europe. It's not like in America where the Congress gets angry if the agricultural minister goes into great detail because the Congress believes this is our task. But in Europe it is the contrary. It is the Commission that can propose. We can just adjust and perfect what they suggest, but we still have the basic problem. Our European agricultural policy is based on fundamentals that have completely changed. Mr. Giacomini, I'm sorry, I know you've written this many, many times, but I have to go on repeating this because we're still lacking the awareness of the problem. When Mrs. Hillary Clinton came to the European Parliament and held the conference in front of all the European MPs and claimed the following, she said, If we were not distracted by the present international economic crisis, we would certainly realize that the big challenge of this century resides in agriculture. Well, this means that they are really worried about this lack of balance and synchronization between supply and demand. So it is necessary to change policies. This is the graph prepared by the General Direction for Agriculture in Brussels. I believe that there is nothing new compared to what we've hear, heard here today. So you can see that European prices compared to world prices show that in Europe the measures undertaken served no purpose whatsoever because they were actually based on a lower level. So the European policies have actually kept at the quota. They've kept on with the quota regime, which actually works at European level. And never did we have European problems. I mean, production has always been covered by the European quota.
But this is a topic that is coming back to the foreground. I've also seen some declarations by Italian organizations, and I'm telling you this straight away. Uh, sometimes our dear friend Mr. Abrate uh, poses this issue, but there is no political way to maintain quotas. And then we have voted about this several times, but it is impossible. The majority is against. So we have to think about managing the situation. And then I shall briefly hint to some of our proposals. Uh, the proposals of the European Parliament, uh, especially the one by Mrs. Michel Dantin, who has proposed a quantity management system, which is a bureaucratic mechanism uh, that, however, allows us to manage volumes and quantities. I mean, if we don't like the system, let's develop a different one. I was telling this during the Dranapadano assembly. I mean, you don't like this system, let's develop a different system, but that is the problem. I mean, it is pointless to try and maintain quotas in Europe. This is impossible. It is politically impossible. Uh, there have been voting sessions twice, and even though part of the European Parliament and other European ministers are in favor of the quota system, there is no majority to support it. So it's pointless to keep thinking this way. It is out of question unless there is a miracle. So let's now work on a better management of the quota stamps. So from these general remarks, let's now move to what should be done as far as the post-quota system is concerned. So you can see some history, 2008-2009, we had a group of experts, of top-level experts working on milk. They have worked very well uh, for a long time. We have also participated in this group. And this group has produced several recommendations and suggestions, actually, we expected something more from the European Commission and from the work of this group of experts, but in the end, they actually proposed the milk package, which was presented in 2010, December 2010. As a matter of fact, the changes suggested were not particularly innovative. It actually boiled down to very little. There was an attempt to strengthen contracts so that producers and farmers uh, can organize themselves in a better way with more robust contracts so that part of the European production uh, can be characterized by better contract. So in 2011, an agreement was reached. I'd like to recall that the packages were significantly changed by the Parliament as far, uh, compared to the original proposal by the Commission. I think it is working. I'm talking about production, planning, and the instruments which are used today, and that do seem to work as far as Italian cheese is concerned. And in February 2012, the milk package has become operational. So, okay, there are a few interesting innovations, but um, this is not the soft landing, soft landing proposal that we all expected. Everybody's wondering what is going to happen now in the post-quota period. The package had the purpose of stabilizing the market, rebalancing demand and supply, stabilizing the income of farmers, strengthening their contractual and negotiating power, increasing transparency along the whole chain. And a few new tools have actually been developed uh, and CLAW uh, in the future, I'm sure, will focus even more on what is happening on the market because if you know what happens on the market, you can also react more quickly. Anyhow, at European level, we have to say that the milk package 
uh, is not all that satisfactory. Okay, interesting changes have occurred in Italy to the advantage of the production system, especially the OP cheese. But uh, not much has been made as far as supply management is concerned. Hence the attempt at defining and identifying some innovations uh, in a specific file. So we have direct payment, agricultural development, single OGM, and policy control. So we're negotiating all four files simultaneously. And we have worked very, very hard until yesterday afternoon. And also in transport, we go on with these very demanding meetings. So four hours with the parliament, the council, the commission, during which we try to find an agreement for every little element. Of course, we do not have the participation of all 27 ministers. We only have the Irish minister, who is the chairman at the moment. And he's actually moving towards the position of the parliament. There are some positive steps in this direction. So we hope that a political agreement will be reached under uh, the Irish presidency. But there are still many clouds at the horizon. First of all, the financial issue, this does not depend on us, but it has a very significant effect on us. That is, the European Parliament and the heads of states have not agreed on the long-term balance for the Union. And the agricultural policy takes up 40 percent of this European budget. So we cannot approve of uh, reforming the agricultural policy without knowing about the available funds. OK, they've already found an agreement on the 8th of February, but the parliament does not agree on this. So the situation is still stagnating as far as financial resources are concerned. And this does not only apply to the agricultural policy, but also to other policies, Horizon 2020, and so on and so forth. Everything is stagnating because the council does not want to meet the modest requests of the European Parliament. I mean, we did not ask to change figures. We're fully aware of the fact that figures are what they are, because there is an economic crisis, because they have been negotiated already. But we want to obtain a review possibility. That is, in two years, we want to be able to renegotiate the financial issues, because maybe in two years, the economic situation will be different. And Europe might be able to prevent the curbing of so many projects that cannot be carried out because of the amazing cuts that have been made from one billion 50 million to 960 uh, billion. So 100 billion euros less for Europe in a seven year period. So the cut is so amazing. Uh, even though agriculture had perhaps a better position than other sectors. But anyway, there will be a cut. Having said this, uh, as long as this negotiation is not over, we cannot progress. Schulz, Lamassur, Lewandowski, Met, these are the different protagonists, political protagonists, and the meeting was a failure. So everybody is saying that the agreement on the budget won't take place during the Irish presidency. So there will be agreement as far as the common agricultural policy is concerned. I'm talking about the final agreement. This is for the press. This is the final agreement, the voting session. Of course, it will be possible to reach a political agreement on direct payment and rural development, but this will depend on the available financial resources. So after the political agreement, the Commission will vote. Well, we can't vote unless there is a formal conclusion of the financial budget definition. So 
this determines everything. However, uh, steps forward have actually been made as far as the specific contents are concerned. And I would like to quote only one of these. And then I shall stop here unless you want to have more information on other topics. So, innovations. on GMO, focus on different products. Michel Dante's idea, which we voted and passed as a mandate, is the following one. And since we're not going to have any more quotas, since in 2015 there will be no quota system any longer, let's create at European level a mechanism which will be managed by the member states to define a production target. So let's define a European quota, quota between inverted commas, because there will be no fine, so uh, it is not a quota, it is a target. So let's define a target which will be defined for each member state and with productive Figures, and each member state will have to meet this requirement, um, not through applying fines, but with incentives and disincentives. In other words, all dairy farms that meet the targets will receive a prize by their member state. So as far as the common market organization is concerned, this hypothesis by Mr. Dantin has raised significant worries. The northern European countries are against. The mechanism is too complicated. And without quotas and without fines, things are not going to work, they claim, because the price, the incentive may not be sufficient. So since we're here in front of experts, I'll tell you the following. Forget about Dantin's proposal. Find something else. The pressure by the parliament in favor of the quota system, uh, since there is no majority to maintain it, well, we have to find a mechanism for the post-quota period a mechanism that will have to be within the budget of our common agricultural policy. And the commissioner, as well as many ministers, specifically the French minister, believe that milk is a very important element for political initiatives. And in September, A European event will take place that will focus on milk. I don't know whether we shall be able to obtain from this initiative, which is probably going to be a seminar or a symposium, uh, that will take us to the reformation of the agricultural policy. And so maybe we'll have a second milk package or we may be able to introduce these changes into the number one milk package. But what is for sure, and this is the message I would like to leave you with, there is the opportunity to go back to ideas linked to the management of the milk market. Which are the tools we should use to manage the post-quota period? Having said this, Uh, I believe I can stop here, but of course I'm willing to answer all your possible questions. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie, Presidente. Uh, innanzitutto ci arriva una segnalazione. Thank you, thank you, dear President. Uh, we are just receiving right now from Brussels. So they are saying that uh, the event that you said to be held in Paris uh, will take place in the Netherlands in 2014. 